Welcome to this Debaco University video. We're going to be looking at drug analysis procedures for a forensics chemist. So some of the specifics, some of the options that might be used, a little bit some of the lab-based settings uh, and procedures that would be used to analyze different drugs brought into the lab. So starting with, in order to get that material in the lab, it first needs to be collected. So collecting that material that you're going to send to the lab. While individual labs may have specific handling procedures, the following is intended to provide a basic overview of the drug analysis procedure. So depending on the very specific type of drug, depending on the type of lab you might be going to, there might be greater detail. This is meant to provide a general guide. So step one is to determine the amount of material. More is not necessarily always better. Uh, evidence submitted can uh, vary widely in the amount that's collected. So by finding the total mass of the material, this can determine what tests can be and cannot be done due to the amount of material there is to work with. So where in doubt, try to collect as quote, much as you can within reason, because uh, that may limit the amount of steps uh, that can be done or procedures carried out. But this isn't always the case. You want to make sure that you're only collecting the isolation of material. You don't want to have other contaminants in there. This is why more is not always better. But the amount that you can collect will limit or potentially determine what tests will be carried out from there. Uh, initially, you might do a presumptive test. So this is the goal of screening out the material uh, to classify into a general category. Common presumptive test, uh, microscopic analysis, uh, microcrystal analysis, and ultraviolet spectrometry, as well as some in-field um, test kits if you're looking at spe specific drugs that are typically commonly found. So looking here, we have the microscope analysis. This is a visual inspection of the general structure of the material. The goal is to provide a broad classification. Typically it's used for larger materials, such as plant material, uh, because it's not really great at getting at some of the molecular structures, just more what does it look like under high power magnification. They can also lead us to microcrystal analysis, and this involves dissolving a small amount of the material and then allowing crystals to form. Viewing the crystals with the aid of polarized light can help determine their structure, uh, and this can help classify, again, that material and acts as another step in that um, analysis process. They mentioned ultraviolet uh, spectrometry, where we're projecting ultraviolet light, which is that 380 nanometers of wavelength of light, and measured, uh, measuring the absorbance can help provide a general classification of that material. So we're going to react more to the UV light than others. And it's also an easy light source uh, to carry around uh, and, can, and to be used and projected in a laboratory setting as well. Then we get into what we call confirmatory tests, and these are used to identify the material and often continue where a presentive test left off. The presentive test will give us a general idea, and then the confirmatory test will tell us exactly what it is, or that's at least the intention, is to use or develop a chemical signature and then match that up with a particular type of substance. Now, one example that might be used here is called gas chromatography, or uh, GC. This is very commonly used um, in laboratory settings. So keep in mind that gas chromatography is a type of chromatography used to analyze uh, chemistry for separating out and analyzing compounds that can be vaporized without decomposition. So this is where that presentive test might come into play, because this uh, might lead you to use, if you have available, gas chromatography. It's used typically in forensic and analysis with the main use for testing bodily fluids. The use of the GC includes testing the purity of a particular substance or separating out different components of a mixture, which is the relative amounts such as components can be determined. So how much contaminants might be there? What is the purity of the substance detected? Uh, gas chromatography can also be used to identify a compound or residues from explosives. So again, has multiple uses and is a very common method used. Then we have something called liquid chromatography, which operates around the same basic idea as gas chromatography, except this is a technique used to separate samples into its individual components based on their interactions of the sample with a mobile and stationary phase. You may have done separation on a very basic scale, like for example, inks uh, of pens, or for example, plant material separating out chlorophyll. Um, these are examples of liquid chromatography. Then we have uh, capillary electrophoresis, or uh, abbreviated CE. Uh, and this is an analytical technique that separates ions, which are neutral substances, are not affected, so keep that in mind. Uh, it separates these ions based on their uh, 
electrophoric mobility and use in applied voltage. So we say it simply have to have a charge. This is because neutral substances will not be affected. We need like a slightly positive or slightly negative charge here. This mobility will depend on the charge of that molecule in addition to the viscosity and the atom's radius. Capillary electrophoresis is used predominantly because it gives fast results and provide higher resolution separation. It's a useful technique based on there is a large range of detection methods available. So there's some specifics here. The rate at which the particles move is proportional to the applied electrical field. So this can allow for greater separation uh, based on the field strength. If two ions are of the same size, the one with a greater charge will move faster. So it allows a greater degree or specificity of separation. And for ions with the same charge, the smaller particle has less friction and they will have a faster migration rate. So this is what allows this uh, to have a very high degree of separation, even if some properties are similar. The lab equipment used for this compound identification uh, process, the only two covered here, but the goal is the same with the ability to identify specific compounds being tested. Each requires specific protocols to be followed in addition to proper setup and maintenance of the material, the equipment uh, over a period of time. So we have the mass spec, uh, mass spectrometry, and this is an analytical method that employs ionizations and mass analysis of the compounds in order to determine the mass formula and the structure of the compound being analyzed. We can see also this is another um, highly specific uh, process that allows those compounds to be more precisely identified that cannot be done in the field. And then lastly, we have infrared spectrometry, which is analysis using infrared light interacting with a molecule. So this can be analyzed in three ways by measuring absorption, emission, and also reflection. The main use of this technique is in organic and inorganic chemistry. It's used by chemists to determine the functional groups in molecules. So again, another great laboratory-based test to get at specifically identifying the compounds in the substance uh, that is initially brought into the lab.